Coming up on Theatre Talk. You can't really have a working class actor in a, in a Rattigan play because there are no working class roles except for some Servants. awful maid. <laughs> Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. It is the 100th anniversary of the birth of a terrific English playwright, Terence Rattigan. We are going to talk about Terence Rattigan, his life, and his plays. Tonight, uh, he wrote some plays you probably know, The Winslow Boy, The Browning Version, The Deep Blue Sea, and a particular favorite of mine, Separate Tables. He was, at the time, I believe, the highest paid screenwriter in London and was very, very successful in the West End. And to talk about his life and his works, we are joined by John Simon uh, of John Simon Uncensored, your new website, John, where you uh, are free to say whatever you want to say about anything and anyone. Well, the blog is more important. Which is Uncensored John Simon. And there I'm really free. <laughs> <laughs> Ter terrorizing everybody. And John is also writing reviews for the Westchester Guardian and the Yonkers Tribune. And he is a pro Terence Radigan fan, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Taking the opposite side is someone who is uh, not so keen on Terence Radigan. Where uh, is he? <laughs> <laughs> John Halpern, who was for many years the uh, drama critic at the New York Observer and is now a contributing editor to Vanity Fair, where he has a monthly column. Welcome to the Theater Talk, John. And sitting in the middle, braving two critics, is so. one of the few actors, I think, who really can act kind of world that Terence Radigan created in his plays. Our good friend Edward Hibbert. Welcome back to Theatre Talk, Edward. Uh, the way you started it, I thought you were going to say he's one of the few actors who can brave sitting between two critics. Well, that, that too. <laughs> yes, how do you feel about that before we launch into Radigan? It's a first. <laughs> Behave yourselves, boys. <laughs> um, okay, John, I, I said in the introduction that uh, while Radigan remains popular and influential as plays in London, we don't see much Radigan in New York anymore. Why do you think that is? The trouble is that most of his plays flopped on Broadway. Really? Yeah, I mean, for a long time they kept flopping, and then finally there were one or two that didn't. Mm -hmm. And I read some of the reviews, even by people like Harold Clerman, who I thought would know better, but no, they were mostly unfavorable reviews. Somehow the English sensibility mm -hmm. in those days did not translate into the American sensibility. Whether it does now, I don't know. But in those days, you remember Shaw's famous remark, which I won't quote because everybody knows it. You better quote it because we, we, we know. don't know yes, it. Yes, please. <laughs> oh, he said we are two countries separated by the same language. Oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the same dramatic language that somehow separated the two countries. Mm -hmm. Now, John, you wrote a terrific biography of John Osborne. Thank you. And John Osborne was the playwright who kind of destroyed the world of the Terence Radigan mm -hmm. elegant drawing room play. Do you think... Yes. Do you think Osborne had to do that? Do you think those plays had really outlived their purpose at that time? Well, there's so many revivals of them in England right now. That, that, not so, but at the time it was very necessary, really. Mm. It was a convulsive revolution, really, in British theatre, right, Edward? But, uh, uh, Osborne and Wesker, Pinter, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And on the global stage, guys like uh, Beckett, uh, Brecht, my goodness me, were not about cozy, middle-class, safe, bourgeois dramas. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether I'd use the word bourgeois per se about some of Rattigan's plays. Mm -hmm. I think, going back to what John was saying about the exportability of Rattigan, mm -hmm. if you think about what his plays... I mean, he wrote some very charming, enduring comedies. Yeah. French Without Tears, his first big, big hit. Yeah. Um, While the Sun Shines, um, Love in Idleness, which I think Lynn Fontaine did on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And then he would go to these darker plays, such as, well, Separate Tables to a Degree, um, Cause Celebre, yeah, yeah. about the Alma Rattenbury uh, murder trial. And uh, there were others such as that. So there was a, a lot of an, it's an English emotional reserve, mm. which is what his, his um, territory is. And I don't think that's 
it, I think it can be appreciated over here, but I'm not sure. I mean, a play like The Deep Blue Sea, it, I think that is the definition of a play which, is, mm -hmm. which, which epitomizes English emotional sensibility. Very elegantly put in defense of his work, of course, and you're right. But the emotional reticence and, and the idea that no one could ever speak the truth yeah. Uh, at least of all about your sexually repressed life mm. and that this had to be disguised according to the, the mores of the time and also according to the audience you're appealing to. That's right. Why, why would that appeal to an American audience in particular where everything is on the table uh, and why would it appeal to a segment, a large segment of the British population who was, was Osborne's world? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, who were these strange people called young people? <laughs> and there were, there were strange people called working class people. Yes, and of course that's when uh, writers like Radigan and Coward sort of went south yeah, yeah. with the yeah. emergence of the Osborne. They were the mu Pinters. much to their own uh, bitterness, which is very understandable, because they were made irrelevant. The reason that the taste swung over from the Rattigan, Coward, uh, Lonsdale, Novello, whoever they were, yeah. to Osborne and that crowd is that the, the social situation changed. Mm. After the war, I mean, austerity set in England, set in, in England, and those new playwrights wrote about austerity, uh, whereas the old playwrights wrote about Savile Row and, and Rolls Royces and luxurious living and cigarette holders. And naturally, if the society changes, the plays will change too. Mm. I want to ask you though, John, do you disagree when, when John Halpern says there was th this cozy bourgeoisness to it? Because I get a sense from those plays that he's kind of undermining that cozy. Of course he was. I mean, he, one of his most, most famous saying is, the vis anglais is not flagellation and not pederasty or pederasty. Uh, it is emotional coldness, emotional withholding, emotional reticence. Mm -hmm. And obviously he was writing about it, but not in favor of it, but in condemnation of it. Yes, that's an, a very nice revisionist approach to what he was really doing. But, 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 but he, he wasn't, because he, he, he invented, as his audience, as, as you, you will remember, Edward, uh, uh, the ideal audience, member he christened Aunt Edna. That's right. Right? No, that wasn't the ideal. That was the typical. It was the his ideal audience, John, in 1952, and I'll quote it for you because I brought it along just in case you argued with it. Right? And it's the introduction to his own selected yeah, plays. Yes, I know. And his uh, perfect audience, who he nicknamed Aunt Edna, quote, didn't possess much knowledge or discernment. Uh, she is, and I quote, in short, a hopeless lowbrow. <laughs> Please note that, John. Yeah. Adding <laughs> that the dramatist who displeased her is, quote, utterly lost. So, John, or may I call you Aunt Edna, <laughs> the fact of the matter fun. is that's who is appealing to and well, that's who the Osborne generation killed. Uh, killed. And, you don't and they think... meant to kill him, even though Osborne liked his plays. Yeah, but John, you don't want to hear this. this plays. I just didn't... No, but I don't mind. When I Go return on. to our shared mother country, <laughs> I mean, I grew up in a generation of actors where it was mandatory that you had to do a Radigan play. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. were probably three on in the West End at the same time. Every repertory theater, every regional theater would do a Winslow Boy or a whatever. But now, partly because the centennial is upon us, but mm. even over the last five or seven years, I go back fairly regularly, there's a revival, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, there's a Winslow boy in the West End, packed with Aunt Edna's. Yes. <laughs> Paying full price, John. You know, I mean, yeah, well, there we are. They like this. They like love those it. plays yes. with those good sofas. <laughs> Let me give John and Simon a chance to respond to the yeah. uh, I, to I the just attack. think that John overlooks the irony <laughs> in, in um, Rattigan when he writes those things. He's the making fun of Antenna. The, the twinkle in his eye, which somehow does not twinkle for John. <laughs> well, I wasn't there at the time, John, so I don't know. <laughs> How about the twinkle of this in his eye? <laughs> which is a, another statement which I brought along, John, 
just in case, <laughs> uh, that he made in the New Statesman, 1950, right? I don't think ideas per se, social, political or moral, have a very important place in the theatre. <laughs> that would do in the entire work of Shaw, Brecht and Beckett to name but three at least one of whom I know you like. <laughs> oh, I like more than one. Well, he said he concentrated on character. What he was interested in was not ideas, but character. Mm -hmm. But if you concentrate on character sympathetically enough, deeply enough, uh, understandingly enough, out come ideas because people stand for things. If I'm a mad communist, that is an idea. Mm -hmm. If I am a, a dedicated Catholic, that is an idea. I mean, it may be a very simple idea. It may be a, a kind of unexamined idea, but it is an idea. Well, I just want to say, John Halpern, that Edward Albee said very much the same thing. I remember once he gave a lecture about playwriting. He said, don't write plays about ideas. Write plays about people mm. and characters. The fact of the matter is that, that, that uh, this was a world of theater known as the Lone Show Play, actually. It had a generic term to it, a Lone Show Play. What does that mean, the Lone Show Play? It was a play that went down very well in Hartford, Hereford, and Hampshire. <laughs> but, um, the Lone Show Play was a generic term for the curt plush curtain, as you described, goes up on a drawing room, and there are French windows. Always. Always. And, and an alternate choice of a, a, a baby grand piano, in case a it's a no car. <laughs> uh, there we are. And that was the Lone Ship play. It was a middle class play uh, 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 for a particular audience of the time. Mm. Right? And that dominated England for something like 30, 40 years. Mm. And there had to be a pushback against it, and that was ours. Well, as John uh, has pointed out, there was a, a social change of extraordinary. Uh, uh, the, a new youth culture came in. Uh, the necessity of new working class actors. You can't really have a working class actor in a, in a Rattigan play because there are no working class roles except for some Servants. awful maid. <laughs> you so would say in a posh accent. Speaking of that, total upper middle class. Yeah. Uh, yes. but he chose to write about, I mean, middle to upper class people. And, and, and not only that, sorry, just to add to that because it's important you know that there was no other form of theater there was the West End, yep. which farmed out all these plays right. uh, to the uh, uh, excellent reps that existed at the mm -hmm. time. So that was the theater that uh, dominated English life. But meanwhile, English life was changing. And the other thing that was this flip over where the sexual revolution was at almost at hand. Mm -hmm. And Radigan himself said that it was more important to express the implicit rather than the explicit. Mm -hmm. It was more important what the actors did not say, what the characters did not say, but what the characters did say. And so all the, uh, the emotion was roiling and repressed in Radigan plays, where suddenly you had, uh, look back in anger, uh, Jimmy hits his wife in the head with an iron. It's a whole other way of expressing human interaction, isn't it, that suddenly came upon Yeah, or Joe theater. Orton having a character killing an old man yeah. and entertaining <laughs> yeah. Mr. Yeah. Stone. Yeah. Let's talk about the, uh, his sexuality, because he, he was gay, yep. but repressed, as Susan says, you know, it's uh, implicit, not explicit. Um, how, um, how important to the work do you think his, is his homosexuality, John? <clears throat> well, I think very, but it, it's important to be, he belonged, to add, that he belonged to a generation where if you were gay, uh, it wasn't, strictly speaking, necessary to declare it. Coward never, no coward never did. He belonged to that uh, class that, that thought uh, it wasn't necessary to come out. Well, and I it thought was it was also, a problem if you did. It was also, yes. Illegal. It was also illegal. Yeah. yeah. And uh, a crime. Mm -hmm. um, so you could be imprisoned by it or certainly publicly humiliated. Mm -hmm. um, that that's said, he could have actually come out later if he wished to when the law changed and, and he could have written plays where he, he it made it clear that the character was meant to be a homosexual mm -hmm. or a tortured homosexual in his case. 
Um, uh, but he didn't because uh, presumably he didn't think that that would be acceptable to his following. And, he, and his mother. He did not want his mother to know. That's right. His mother, who went to every opening night and sat in the box with him, he was horrified that she may discover that he was, in fact, a Somehow I suspect sexual. she may have uh, had some suspicions. Since, uh, since she lived to be very old, <laughs> that meant dissembling for quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> but, and and it, it made it a personal tragedy, didn't it? Because he was a sensitive man. Yeah. We were talking earlier, before we began this, about the second half of Separate Tables, which I think is quite well known because of the movie version, right. in which this spinster forges an allegiance with this old retired army major, mm -hmm. and it, he is revealed to have been found making passes or fiddling with <laughs> ladies in the darkened movie theater from a local town. Yeah. When it came to New York, he rewrote it, that the retired army major was indeed doing the same with young men in the movie theaters, and then pulled that change. And you were saying, John, earlier... Uh, yeah, the, his biographer says that had he not made that change, that would have freed him no. for all kinds of things later on. But let me say this. <laughs> he was a great proponent of the Albertine strategy, to use Stanley Edgar Hyman's term based on Proust, where a character in real life called Albert becomes Albertine in truth so as to be heterosexual rather than homosexual. Right. Well, that's what he did. But the funny thing is, you know, Stanley Kaufman wrote a famous piece about why don't these playwrights face their homosexuality. Yeah. And, like, and when they did, the plays became less good. It's certainly true of, Tra of Rattigan. His Albertine plays were better than his Albert plays. Mm. I do think that it, it, it's not quite the case that this galloping colonel of the of um, Bournemouth, who, <laughs> who, uh, tables. <laughs> who, who uh, was played by the charming David Niven, yeah. because I caught it on the telly the other day, mm. by happy chance, and he gives, when he's, when he's found out, and all, all the uh, old ladies and, uh, at the hotel are horrified, they're absolutely aghast that this upright man could um, fiddle about with women in, and, and it's quite clear that what the meaning is. But the speech that he gives the man is not one of regret or it is one of self-loathing that he wishes he was someone else. Mm -hmm. And that's the homosexuality disguised. that's how disguised. you pander to a shocked middle brow audience that therefore feels sorry for this man who realizes that to be a a uh, closet homosexual is evil, not because you're in the closet, but because you're a homosexual. Mm. And that's where I think he got it rather confused. Well, maybe so, but what does that prove about his quality as a playwright, or lack of quality? Uh, <coughs> what does it prove? Uh, it's, uh, what, it, what does it prove? The point is, the, it, whether the subject is this, whether the implicit subject is that, Neither of those things is very important, except to critics and scholars. What is important is, how does it play? Mm -hmm. And as long as it plays well, the things that he wrote play well. Whether it's for this reason or that reason or the other reason doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they played well then and they play well now. And now that we somehow seem to be less different from Europe, we can appreciate his plays more than they were then appreciated. Now, John, I want to ask you, you met him, you interviewed him. Yes, I interviewed him. He was very nice. Yeah, what, what was a lovely he like? man he was. It was my first interview, and I didn't know how to run a tape recorder. <laughs> so he very kindly ran the tape recorder for us, which was my job, but he did it. And he was extremely pleasant and, and kind and saw that I was inexperienced and covered up for it in every way he could. Mm. And I was deeply touched, especially since I had reviewed Ross, which is what he was here for, rather negatively. What was Ross? It was Ross, the play about the about the Lawrence. Ah, right, right. Um, which was not his best play by any means, but but anyway, he was extremely gentlemanly and and elegant and pleasant and kind, mm. and that that sort of won me over very much. Could we ask John Halpern what does it matter? I mean, he just posed the question to you, what does it matter? Well, I guess it, it doesn't matter if you're happy watching that play. But uh, I believe it does matter that you 
you should uh, falsely gain a, the sympathy of, uh, of Aunt Edna when uh, you should be, uh, in a way, challenging Aunt Edna a bit to be tolerant of homosexuals. It would be better to challenge the Aunt Ednas of his audience to something less safe, such as accepting the fact that people are homosexuals and possibly proud of it. But We're how sad he probably didn't believe that. You know. I don't think it was, there, there, there was obviously some self-loathing, but I don't think you can say of all the characters that they're self-loathers. Uh, take the characters in The Winslow Boy. Uh, who is self-loathing in that? Uh, not, certainly not the father, certainly not the boy after a while, and certainly not the lawyer. Um, so it's not really about Well, no, they're, they're, they're just, you know, emotionally reticent. It comes out of a period where my generation finds it difficult uh, to live with, to accept in general. Of course, he was a marvelous craftsman. His plays are extremely mm. popular, and they touched a chord in their day, and apparently they still do. I'm not quite so certain that they do for the best possible reasons, but they do. And that is swell, but don't forget that, <laughs> that, uh, that a playwright called Sheila Delaney wrote A Taste of Honey in direct response to Terence Rattigan and Terence Rattigan's world and invented a wonderful mm. homosexual character, which you can see in the movie version, which is tremendous, directed by uh, Tony Richardson. And she wrote a wonderful play in direct response to him. Which, well, which would show you the positive effects that his plays had. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I know I'm being hard. I, I like. I feel. I, I, I feel badly this. now. I feel badly. You feel bad. Sorry. Uh, I, um, no, I, I like the Sheila Delaney play quite a bit too. Uh, but the fact that it was written in response to, to or directly opposite of Vatican, that's almost to Vatican's credit, because anyone who by any means can provoke another writer into writing something brilliant is to be thanked, even if it's a kind of left-handed compliment. Now, we've, we have to wrap it up. Um, since we don't see the plays a lot, there are some movies uh, of Radigan's. And I'm curious to know, Edward, is there a movie of his that you're fond of that you would I'm very fond of, and I must just make this clear, the original film version of the Browning version yes. with Michael Redgrave yes. giving, I think, a great performance. It's a beautiful short story of a play. I like it very much. Yeah, that's the one set uh, in the uh, boys' school. Public school, yeah, yeah. Uh, schoolmaster. You know, Radigan also read the screenplay to Goodbye, Mr. Chips, the musical. Did you know that? Yes. I didn't Peter know this. O'Toole and Petula Clark. Yes. Uh, Anthony Newley and Leslie Brickis score, I think, or yes, Leslie Brickis' nice song. Yes, rather nice score. I find it riveting that of all writers, David Mamet <laughs> should have taken on um, The Winslow Boy. Yeah, which he And adapted. done his own adaptation of it. If you think about what, bipolar, Mallet to Rattigan. Mm -hmm. uh, that's good. Separate Tables movie, it's all right. John, do you have anything you can recommend of Rattigan's? I know we're <laughs> not exactly a fan. Absolutely, for sure. The VIPs. Oh, uh, yes, a movie. That's wonderful a movie. Yeah. Burton, AMC Taylor, all the time. Yeah. Margaret Rutherford, who else? Maggie Smith. Maggie Smith. Yeah. Wonderful rainy day afternoon uh, movie. Soap opera, really. Of an, uh, uh, the uh, the other one is the Wimslow Boy. It's a super film, mm -hmm. and if you want to know a cultural difference with America, it's Mamet's ruination of a film, surely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, who redu who had no idea what understatement is? Why would he? Mm. Why would he know what emotional repression is? Who's in the original, by the way, Wimslow Boy, the movie? Robert Donat? It is Robert Donat. Robert, Robert Donat. Donat. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, I was just going to say how wonderful it is to have in the Winslow Boy a father fighting for his young son's honor, saying that the boy didn't filch money. That's a yes. order, Consider that with it's today's it's standards. It's about justice. <laughs> about justice. The price of justice. Yes. And yep. it's clarion call that right must be done. Uh -huh. Well, you can agree with that. I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm delighted, though, that Radigan all these years still provokes. Um, Deb debate. debate. Why not? John Simon from um, John Simon Uncensored, yeah. which is the website, and Uncensored John Simon is the blog, yeah. and the Westchester Guardian, Guardian and the Yonkers Tribune. Yeah. Uh, John Halpern from Vanity Fair. Thanks. Running down poor old Terry Radigan. Oh, no. <laughs> and our dear friend uh, Edward Hibbert, uh, who yeah. I would love to see in a Radigan play. Have you done a Radigan play ever? I did. 
Which I one? told you it was mandatory. I did one called While the Sun Shines ah, I when know. I was a juvenile. I hope to. Many I, moons ago. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being our guest tonight on Theater Talks. Thanks. Appreciate it. A bourbon and water, no ice. I'll get it. No. <laughs> Afraid I'll poison it? <laughs> I much enjoy American wisecracks, and it is absurd, isn't it? Sven watches over me like an hysterical mother. But there have been attempts to poison me. How many is it, Sven, over the years? Seven. Not to mention an attempted machine gunning once in Berlin, and then a very clever attempt to run me over with a truck that was in uh, Paris, I think. Here in New York, April 31. A wonderful memory he has. And tonight, of all nights, there must be at least, oh, a thousand people, all of them bitter enemies, all of them powerful, all of them capable of murder, to whom my death would come as a pleasurable surprise. From that list, I entirely exclude you, Miss Ben. I can only apologize. That's fantastic. You can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org. Or you can Twitter us. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>